This evening, uh, we're, we're continuing a topical study on why it is we believe in an optimistic future. And I need, I need to be careful, that if, as I'm entitling this series, I need to realize that some of these things may be my belief, but not your belief, and I'm using the word we. Um, so it may not be necessarily we, it may just be me, but I'm hoping uh, that you will embrace this as well. Perhaps we should call this why we should believe in an optimistic future rather than why we believe in one. But uh, this evening, we're going to be looking at um, the eminent return or so-called eminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ and whether that is, in fact, what the Bible teaches. Because if it is, it does stand in the way of what, um, well, at least the picture that we've been painting, or at least that I believe the Bible paints, of an optimistic future. And what I'd like to do is read for you one example of, uh, of, the, of the passages that uh, deal with uh, what is called the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. You've actually already seen one in the meditation that was on the screen prior to the service, at least if you were here early enough to see that. But let me uh, read for you the second one, which is the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And feel free to follow along on the screen or read it in your Bibles. But this is what we read. Jesus says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. While they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Now again, uh, the things we've been looking at that remind us that we do have reasons to be optimistic about the future is first of all the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is reigning now. He is on the throne. He is in absolute sovereign control of everything that goes on in the world, everything that goes on in the universe. We've also seen that the Father has made him a promise to subdue all of his enemies under his feet. And we've seen indications in Scripture that that subjection of his enemies is going to have a profound impact on the world. So that was the first thing we saw. Jesus is reigning. The Father's going to subdue his enemies. And there are indications in Scripture of a glorious future for the kingdom of heaven in this world before Jesus Christ returns. Now, we've also been looking at those passages that often come up when we think about an optimistic future that seem to stand in the way, seem to indicate that there are troubled times ahead, and that we can't expect uh, something good to happen, such as Daniel 9, the Olivet Discourse, Book of Revelation, which we've also looked at already to this point, and uh, at least if you follow along with what I've been saying, I believe those passages are all referring to what the Lord did to Israel in 70 AD when he brought judgment upon the Jews for their rejection and murder of God's Son. Again, we've been looking at that in the morning and the evening, so we should be fairly familiar with that. So far, there appears to be every indication that the Lord intends to do something uh, marvelous, something wonderful in this world before Jesus comes again to put an end to human history. Now this evening I'd like for us to look at one more thing that appears to stand in the way of an optimistic future, and that is the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ, which means, or at least which teaches, that Jesus could come at any minute. As a matter of fact, he could come before I finish the next sentence. He could come before the service is over. He could come before the night is out. He could come basically at any time 
to bring an end to the world. Now, obviously, if that could happen, then what we see right now in the world could be as good as it gets. As you can see, an imminent return of Christ could cut short an optimistic future. Now, what I'd like to do then is look at two things this evening. First of all, why it is some believe that Jesus Christ could come at any minute. And secondly, what those passages that seem to indicate his imminent return are really speaking about if it's not that. So first of all, why do some believe that Jesus could come at any minute? Well, that's really a big subject because not everybody has agreed on the reasons, but let me at least give you a few examples. First of all, uh, charismatics, especially Pentecostals, believe that the uh, supposed restoration of the spiritual gifts that in their view began at Azusa Street in Los Angeles, I think it was in 1906, signaled the beginning of the last days. The last days, of course, leading up to the return of Christ. Now, this is what they believe that Peter was actually speaking about on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. When he said, that, well, at least when, when uh, Luke recorded this, of what Peter said. Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall come about in the last days. God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now, in the view of Pentecostals and Charismatics, these, these last days are the final days, as I've said, before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which begins with the coming of Christ to rapture his church out of the world just before the tribulation and continues until the final judgment actually takes place. By the way, this is tied in with what we saw this morning some believe that the phrase, uh, the, the day of the Lord, can only refer to that very, those very last events when the Lord begins to pour out of his judgment uh, upon the earth, which begins during the tribulation period after Jesus removes his church out of the world and actually concludes with the great white throne judgment, which is after the seven years and then after the thousand years and so forth, but as we saw this morning, the day of the Lord doesn't necessarily mean just one thing. The day of the Lord is whenever the Lord brings judgment against a nation. And that's one of the reasons why the confusion exists here, why some Pentecostals, Charismatics look at this passage and believe it's referring to our day. Because Peter goes on to say this, and I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, notice the imagery that we saw this morning, the sun being darkened, the moon and so forth, changes in the heavens uh, as well as this this phrase, the day of the Lord. So they believe that this resurgence, or at least the supposed resurgence of charismatic gifts that began in 1906 in Azusa Street are signaling the beginning of the last days, the countdown toward the day of the Lord. And that's why they believe that Christ's coming could be at any time. It's imminent. Now, Pentecostals and Charismatics are also part of a larger group that actually believe that this, this imminent return of Jesus Christ could have been at any time from the time that Jesus ascended. In other words, he could have gone up and then come right back down. That group is known as dispensationalism, and I thought I would give you a representative statement from one of the leading spokesmen of dispensationalism, John MacArthur, uh, one of my, my favorites as well. I think many of us appreciate him. 
He is a dispensationalist, but I want you to realize he's not a charismatic or a Pentecostal. I want to make sure that you get that. That's plain. But he sums up his view and the view of dispensationalists in general with regard to the imminent return of Jesus Christ in the opening words of his essay entitled, Is Christ's Return Imminent? This is what he writes. Christ could come at any moment. I believe that with all my heart. Not because of what I read in the newspapers, but because of what I read in Scripture. From the very earliest days of the church, the apostles and first generation, generation Christians nurtured an earnest expectation and fervent hope that Christ might suddenly return at any time to gather his church to heaven. James, writing what was probably the earliest of the New Testament epistles, expressly told his readers that the Lord's return was imminent. He writes this, Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Wait patiently for it until it, reserves, until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Uh, Peter echoed the same expectation when he wrote, quote, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Close quote. The writer of Hebrews cited the eminent return of Christ as a reason to remain faithful. Quote, Let us consider one another in order to stir up, uh, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Close quote. He wrote, quote, yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry, close quote. And the Apostle John made the most confident pronouncement of all, quote, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour, close quote. When John recorded his vision in the book of Revelation, he prefaced it by saying, these things must shortly take place. The New Testament writers often wrote of Christ appearing, and they never failed to convey the sense that this could happen eminently. Quote, and now little children abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Close quote. Now, as again, MacArthur believes, as dispensationalists believe, that Jesus Christ, that his return, could have happened in their days suddenly and that they ought to be ready at all times because of that. Now, this belief in Christ's imminent return has only escalated since 1948 when, of course, the Jews were reconstituted as a nation of Israel. They believe that is the fulfillment of the fig tree putting forth its leaves, which means, of course, in, well, at least in their view, that this is going to happen just before the coming of Christ. That generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, amillennialism, they have not necessarily held, at least I believe as a group, that Jesus could have returned at any time after his ascension. They did believe there were certain things that needed to take place first. Uh, Louis Burkhoff writes this, quote, according to scripture, several important events must occur before the return of the Lord, and therefore it cannot be called eminent. In the light of scripture, it cannot be maintained that there are no predicted events that which must still come to pass before the second coming, close quote. Now, that could be at least Burkhoff writes from, uh, I think it was like the middle of the um, 20th century, so mid-1900s. Uh, and I wasn't quite clear whether he was referring to the apostles' perspective or our perspective. I do know many Amils who believe that Jesus Christ could come at any time. In other words, what Burkhoff was writing may not be the case any longer because some 2,000 years have elapsed since the ascension of Jesus Christ, and many of the things that needed to take place, perhaps in his estimation, already have. So again, you have this expectation of the K 
charismatic Pentecostals, 1906, uh, last days because of the resurgence of charismatic gifts. You have dispensational view that the Christ could have come at any time, even from the apostles' perspective. And even though Amils may not necessarily have followed in that vein, it's certainly possible that enough has taken place that Jesus could come at any time. Now, all this is simply to say that the idea that Jesus could come at any time is quite prevalent in the church today. And it has, it has had and continues to have really a profound influence upon the church. And actually, I'm not sure that any of us here have escaped its influence. I don't know how many of you have you know, held to the view that Christ could come at any time. Uh, perhaps you come from a dispensational background, which we were you know, steeped in that idea, uh, especially, of course, as it was uh, 1988 or whatever was, was rolling around 40 years from 1948, this generation not passing away. So what I'd like for us to do is consider for a few moments what these passages that seem to indicate that Jesus could come at any moment are really talking about. Are they talking about the fact that his second coming could be at any time, or is it something else? Well, first of all, let's consider briefly Acts chapter 2, a passage that, again, Peter quotes from Joel with regard to the last days. Now, the longer I live, the more that I'm beginning to see that you really can't take anything for granted even the clearest passages in Scripture can be understood by some or many to mean just about anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was brought out rather uh, uh, poignantly, I think, when uh, Donna and Sarah had a chance to talk to some Mormon young men who believe that the Bible actually teaches that a man can become God and that God used to be a man. I mean, if you can believe that, you can believe the Bible says that, you can believe the Bible says anything. Now, I think either our culture has lost the ability to understand English, or we've gotten into the habit of making the Bible say what we want it to say, rather than allowing the Bible simply to speak for itself and listening to what it says. Now, what is Peter actually saying in Acts chapter 2? Was he meaning to say to them on the day of Pentecost, to the audience that had been gathered by uh, the sound of the rushing wind and all the uh, disciples speaking in different languages, did he mean to say to them that 1,900 years in the future, God was going to pour out of his Holy Spirit and that was going to signal the beginning of the last days? See, I don't understand how you could even get that idea from this text. But what he's actually talking about was what was happening then on that particular day, on the day of Pentecost and why it was that those who were speaking in tongues or in these languages were in fact speaking in these other languages. He says this, For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. I want you to notice he says this is what was spoken of by Joel. Not that 1900 years from now, but this, what was going on now. So this passage has nothing to do with the present day. Again, the confusion comes with the day of the Lord. It comes with the signaling of the last days and the belief that these are the last days and that Peter must have been speaking about these days. But it has nothing to do with these days because these are not the last days. Those were the days in which the Lord was pouring out of his Holy Spirit. Now, what about the passages that MacArthur pointed to? And what about our meditation that tells us to be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming? What about our text that tells us that we must be on the alert, for you do not know the day or the hour? And many other texts like this that seem to indicate that the coming of the Lord is very near, that it's something that could happen at any time. Well, there's a couple of possibilities. First one, I'm not as strong, I think, with the second one, I think, is more likely the case. But the first one is, and this is something to think about, too, is whether or not the New Testament writers themselves fully understood their own prophecies regarding the future. Because we do know it was the case that the Old Testament prophets didn't understand necessarily everything that they had to say. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us that they basically looked at what they had written 
and what they had prophesied, and they themselves were seeking to know exactly when Christ was coming or who this person was. This is what Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. Now that's one possibility. Perhaps they didn't understand even what they were saying. But the other possibility, and I think it's much more likely, is this, that these were not speaking about the second coming of Christ. They were rather speaking about the coming of Christ in 70 A.D. Again, the theme of what we have been looking at through Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse, through Daniel chapter 9, the 40 or excuse me, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and of course the book of Revelation, that it's speaking about Christ coming in judgment against the Jews to destroy the holy city, to destroy the sanctuary, and to disperse the Jews because of their sin against the Lord in crucifying his son. Now again, we've already seen this in these different places in scripture. But we do need to realize that, for instance, what we're looking at in our meditation, uh, what we've seen here in the parable of the 10 virgins, that this actually follows the Olivet Discourse. It's a part of it, as a matter of fact, in which Jesus is telling his disciples to be ready for his coming. And again, which coming is this? Again, I would remind you that um, he is speaking to them. In Matthew 24 and 25, we have exactly the same situation we have in Mark 13. He is speaking to them about the destruction of the temple. Uh, they asked him the question, when are these buildings going to be torn down the way you're talking about? When, you know, what is going to be the sign of your coming to do this? And Jesus answers the question. And his answer, of course, is to their question, and he warns them because they are the ones who are going to see these things actually come about. And then, of course, the clincher, I think, is that the fact that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So again, in Matthew 25, 13, be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Jesus is warning them. They are to be ready like those waiting for the bridegroom to come. They are to be ready at all times when they see the abomination of desolation. That is, Jerusalem surrounded by armies, realize that her desolation is near, then flee, get out of the area. Now, MacArthur pointed out one more passage, I think, that, or pointed out a passage that more than the others showed just how close this event was to them in their days. In 1 John 2.18, children, it is the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Now think about what John just said here. And think about what we saw earlier. Jesus is saying, uh, not only in Matthew 24, verse 5, but also in Mark 13, where he says exactly the same thing. What are the signs leading up to the desolation of, of Jerusalem, to this event, Christ coming in judgment? Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. John says, many antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. Whatever Jesus was warning about, John says, we see from the evidence of all these antichrists. And basically what that means is somebody who claims to be Jesus Christ, somebody who's seeking to take his place. From the fact that all these antichrists have arisen, we know that it is the last hour. We're not just in the last days, John is saying. We're in the very last hours before whatever it is that's going to take place is going to take place. Now, if they, in those days, were not only in the last days, but it was the last hour, 
then how can it be that that hour hasn't elapsed nearly 2,000 years later? It's because it wasn't speaking about our future again. It was speaking about their future, something that was very close to them. And the event that was very near to them was, of course, what we've been talking about through all the other you know, sermons on Mark 13 and the Olivet Discourse, the ones we've been looking at recently. John and Jesus and others were not talking about a catastrophic event that was way in the future. It's something that was very close at hand, and that was 70 A.D. Now, again, one thing that isn't often mentioned, let's, let's, okay, let's set this aside for a moment and move on to one other thing. Okay, there are all these statements about something that's so close, something that's so near, we're in the last minutes, as it were. You know, what is that event? Something 2,000 years in the future or something much closer? Well, I'm saying it's something much closer, but these are the passages, you see, that um, those that believe in an imminent return are looking at and saying that Jesus could come at any moment because of these passages. Be ready at all times. But what if he was talking about 70 A.D.? then those passages no longer really refer to an imminent return of Christ in the second coming for us. It was referring to an imminent return of Jesus Christ to judge Jerusalem back in 70 AD. But here's another uh, argument as to why the, the return of Christ could not be imminent in those days. And that's because there are actually several passages in Scripture that imply that it was going to be a long time before Jesus Christ actually returns. Uh, let me give you several examples. First of all, in the parable of the talents, which comes after the parable of the 10 virgins. Uh, Jesus says this in verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Now, I wanna use this passage just to say this. Could Jesus have ascended and then come right back down? Well, no, not if this parable means anything with regard to time. After a long time, the master of those slaves come and settle accounts with them. Now, a long time implies that his coming could not have been at any time. Now, he could have been referring to the time frame between 30 when he said it and 70 when he came again in judgment against Jerusalem. But even if that's all he meant, the return of Christ could not have been at any time. You see, there was still this intervening time. Now, secondly, in Matthew chapter 21, we have the parable of the vineyard. And I hope you're familiar enough with that to understand what I say, because I don't want to take time to read it. But Jesus tells the Jews that the kingdom of heaven is going to be taken away from them. That the, uh, those um, vine growers that, that that the owner of the vineyard has rented the vineyard to are going to be destroyed. He's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he's going to give the vineyard to another nation, another people, who are going to produce its fruit. Now, how much time is that going to take? You see, it implies at least some time, maybe a great deal of time. In the Olivet Discourse, in Luke 21, Jesus says something else that implies an indeterminate amount of time. In verses 23 and 24, he says, For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, we don't know how long that's going to take, how long the time of the Gentiles is, but we do know that that takes time, so that Christ's return could not have been at any time. We do know that it puts it outside of the time frame that um, these others were speaking of, even with regard to 70 AD, because 70 AD is when they fall. But there's going to be time after that, the time of the Gentiles. Now, if what we saw this morning is true with regard to Mark 13, and that is, you know, the, the darkening of the heavens, the sign of the Son of Man coming, and the sending of the angels, as it were, to gather the elect. If the sending of those angels really is the sending of Christ's messengers armed with the gospel to evangelize the world and to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth, if that is what it means, again, realizing that everything Jesus said there had to be fulfilled before 
that generation passed away, except, of course, the continuance of the work of evangelizing the world, that implies a great deal of time. Now, all this is simply to say that there isn't anything in Scripture that really demands, at least in those days, that Jesus Christ come soon then, so soon as to exclude the possibility that the kingdom of heaven was going to expand. And what about Christ's enemies being subdued under his feet? Sit at my right hand, the Father says to his son, until I subdue all your enemies under your feet. Does that imply time? Or is the implication there that Jesus ascended to heaven and the Father was going to just subdue them all in one shot and Jesus could come at any time? I think the idea of the subjection of his enemies requires time. And I think also, of course, the idea that the subjection of his enemies could usher in what we see in the scriptures of what could be possible in the kingdom of heaven on earth. That certainly requires time as well. Now, what I'm saying is, is this, again, that if the return of Christ is not imminent, then our prayers and our labors in the hope that Jesus Christ is going to use those efforts to build up his kingdom is still very much relevant for us. That, you know, we, we don't, Christ isn't going to come and put an end to all things so that it doesn't really matter what we do. And we do realize that if we do believe in an imminent return of Jesus Christ, we still wouldn't know when that was, and we still need to labor as much as possible. But we're talking about building up a hope that the Lord is going to do something beyond just let, it, let things slide down and get worse and worse until he finally has to come and pull us out of the muck, or just a neck and neck between the two kingdoms with one sometimes getting ground and the other sometimes gaining ground. If there is something that the Lord is promising that is connected with his reign and with the subjection of his enemies that is glorious, it gives us hope, as Jonathan Edwards also pointed out, hope that will encourage us to pray and to labor to that end. So that's why we're trying to remove the obstacles here. Now, one thing I should mention about the imminent return is this, that the imminent return has actually worked against the church in, in some ways. The fact that there are such large portions of the church that have read these passages as indicating that Jesus could have come at any time, even from the time of his ascension, all the way back almost 2,000 years ago, have given really many unbelievers and critics, of course, atheists and so forth, reasons to reject the gospel and to ridicule the church because they say that Jesus said he was coming back soon, that he could have come at any time, and 2,000 years have, come by, have gone by, and he has not returned. What Jesus said was wrong. Therefore, he can't be God. And there's been, a, actually, in Edwards' day, he wrote against that particular opinion because the critics were already criticizing in the 1700s, and I'm sure it was long before then. So whatever those think that they're gaining by saying that Christ's return is imminent, they're losing with regard to the credibility of the gospel because it does seem to make Jesus to be wrong. Now, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 and 7 through 8, it almost, it almost appears to be he's, he's addressing this very issue. Let me read those verses. He says this, know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Now, again, you might be able to read that in a couple of different ways, but consider the implications of that for the coming of the Lord. When is it going to be? Well, Peter says, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Of course, the Lord is, is being merciful. He's allowing a space of time for repentance and so forth, but the Lord will come in his own time. And I believe here he was referring to the second coming. And again, it seems as though he's arguing against those who thought that Jesus was saying that his second coming was imminent. When as a matter of fact, he also said many things that indicated that his coming was a long ways off. 
those passages that talk about eminency didn't, weren't referring to the second coming of Christ to put an end to human history, but they were referring to his coming again in judgment in Jerusalem. And so, again, the point is it doesn't stand in the way of an optimistic future for the kingdom of heaven on earth prior to the second coming. So having said all these things, let me just close again uh, with this, this one note. And this really does have to do with eminency. Uh, why is it that you know, the people, uh, Christians, uh, want to, to hold to an imminent return of Jesus Christ? Well, one of the reasons is that's what they believe the Bible teaches. And of course, as long as they see it that way, that's what they, they need to believe. That's what they need to teach, even though they may be wrong. But they believe that the imminent return of Jesus Christ has another effect on the church, which is a good effect. And that is its sanctifying effect on us. And they believe that's the reason why Jesus said this. If Jesus could come at any moment, he could come at any time, then the implication for you and me is that we need to be ready at every moment to meet him. I mean, isn't that the point of the, of the parable of the ten virgins? To be ready to meet the Lord. Whether that referred only to 70 AD or whether it refers, let's say, to the future, that is the case. I mean, we do need to be ready. And if you take away the eminency of his return, then aren't you just encouraging sin? I mean, if Jesus isn't coming for a long time, why don't we just eat, drink, and be merry, right? And, and wait until we have to do something about it, and then we'll do something about it and get ready then. So this idea of the eminency of Christ's return has a sanctifying effect on the church. Well, granted, but we've also seen it has a downside. Critics look at what those passages say, and they say Jesus couldn't have been right. So again, we've already seen how to answer that. But how do we replace that, or do we need to replace it? Let's just say that the Lord has given us something else that's quite eminent that should have us ready at all times. And that is the fact that Jesus Christ may come at any moment to take us out of the world personally, not to bring an end to human history, but actually to take your soul, to take your life. We know that there is a time that each of us has, a time when the Lord is going to come and he's going to deal with that. So he could come, you see, at any time to collect your soul at death. And that's something which you need to be ready for at all times, because if you die, it's too late to do anything about it. And again, we don't know when that time is. Sometimes we think that we're immortal, especially when we're younger. And we think we have all these years in front of us. You know, after all, the first you know, 18 years, the first 20 years of my life, seemed like such a long time. I still have a long you know, period of time in which to live, a long period of time in which to get ready. I don't have to take it seriously right now. I can do it at any time. But of course, you realize as you get older, that time isn't as long as you thought. And you also don't know that you even have all those years in front of you. There are people who thought they had a lot of time in front of them whose lives were suddenly cut short because of something that happened that was outside their control. Some people just simply drop dead. There's something wrong in their bodies. They don't know it. Something ruptures. They bleed to death within a matter of a few moments. Somebody runs them over. Uh, somebody uh, sh drives by and shoots them. You know, we're getting a lot of shootings going on uh, these days, and you don't know when those things are going to happen. The return of Christ, as it were, for our souls, the end of our lives, is something that is always imminent. And something we always need to be ready for. And I think that can have a very sanctifying effect. It doesn't have to be the coming of Christ to end the world. If our life ends, that's really all that matters for us personally. And that's what seals us in the condition in which we are in when he comes. Which means we have to be ready before he comes. Now, to get ready, you can't just, as, as many uh, will, will tell you today here, Take, take this booklet, it has the sinner's prayer in it, tuck it in your back pocket, and wait until you're ready to die and pray that prayer. I'm, I'm not saying that Christians necessarily tell others they ought to do that, but that's the way that these things are treated. 
I have a prayer that I can pray that will get me ready in just a moment. All I have to do is have the time to say the words or think the words, and I'm going to be saved. You know what? It doesn't work that way because you don't know that you're going to have time to get ready for death. You don't know that you're going to have a death bed. You may die instantly. And not only that, but you can't, by your own will, change your heart. Even if you have that time to get ready, if you learn today that you're dying and you're not a Christian, the fact that you're dying doesn't give you the ability necessarily to save yourself, and it doesn't mean that the Lord is necessarily going to save you. You have to trust in Jesus Christ from the heart because you want to. You need to turn from your sins and follow him. That's the only way you can be ready, and if we understand Scripture properly, the only way you can truly do that is by his grace alone. And that's not something you can just necessarily bring down on yourself because you want it suddenly. You've got to realize if you don't love the Lord, even though you want it, it's not going to be for the right reasons. It's not going to necessarily move the Lord. You need God's grace truly to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and turn from your sins. And that is the only way you're going to be ready for that coming of Christ to take your soul, as it were, out of this world. You need to be ready. So how do you get ready? Well, you get ready by responding to the gospel. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and follow him. And if you find that you can't do that because in your heart you really don't want to do that, because there's other things you're going to have to give up that you don't want to give up, you need to realize there's only one person that can break the power of sin in your heart, and that is Jesus Christ. And in order for him to do that, you need to call upon him and seek him for that grace to do it. But don't wait until the last minute. You do have to be ready at all times to meet the Lord because you don't know the time of your death. And so I counsel you this evening, be ready by trusting in the Lord now. Don't count on it some future time. Again, Edwards pointed out that uh, Satan has a way of deceiving us by telling us when we're young that we have plenty of time, plenty of time for that. Don't worry about that right now. Just have fun right now. Do what you want right now. Plenty of time in the future to serve the Lord, to trust the Lord, and to do what he wants you to do. And then as you whittle away your life listening to the devil or listening to your flesh, you get into your older years, and then he'll begin to say, you know, it's too late for you now. You've already wasted your life. You've already wasted your better years now. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not going to make any difference. You can't now. The Lord won't accept you now because uh, you, you've hardened your heart for so many years. He's not going to accept you now. Satan is a liar. And your flesh will deceive you and try to trick you into wasting your life. Don't listen to your flesh. Don't listen to the enemy. The Lord says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. But instead, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you can't, again, seek him until he gives you the grace to do that. Don't put it off. You cannot afford to do that. The Lord may come at any time. You need to be ready for that coming. And may the Lord grant that mercy to each one of us that we would be ready. Uh, let's uh, bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do that.